Välkommen till det här programmet där vi ska titta lite närmare på det fascinerande sambandet mellan ljus och vår inre klocka. Och hur ljus kan minska besvären av jetlag och depression. Men först ska vi se hur den här inre klockan styrs. Jordens rotation kring sin axel medför växling mellan ljus och mörker, dag och natt. Och kretsloppet kring solen ger en rytmisk årstidsväxling mellan sommar, höst, vinter och vår. Allt liv på jordens yta, växter och djur och också vi människor står under inflytande av solens gång över himlavalvet. Ljus mörkerväxlingar över dygnet ger oss en dygnsrytm på ungefär 24 timmar. Den här rytmen kallas ibland cirkadian, vilket betyder ungefär ett dygn. Vi själva påverkas också av ljus och mörker i fråga om energi, känsloläge och vakenhet och sömn. Ögats näthinna tar emot ljus som omvandlas till nervsignaler som sänds till en inre klocka. Den är lokaliserad till mellanhjärnan. Signalerna går vidare till talkottkörteln mitt inne i huvudet. I talkottkörteln omvandlas nervsignalen till en hormonsignal. Hormonet melatonin bildas i mörker och hämmas av ljus. På det här sättet får alla kroppens organ dygnsinformation via blodbanan. Morgonljuset stänger av bildningen av melatonin och hjärta, lever, njurar, hjärna, ja alla celler i kroppen får veta att nu har en ny dag börjat. Forskningen om ljus och rytmer har visat sig vara betydelsefull för skiftesarbetare och andra med oregelbundet arbetsschema. Flygande personal och passagerare som kan få besvär av så kallad jetlag för äldre och blinda med störd dygnsrytm och vid behandling av depression och sömnstörningar. För att ta reda på mer om hur ljus kan påverka oss ska vi nu träffa en grupp internationella forskare. Jag skulle like dem att identifiera sig genom att ge oss sin respektive researchprofil. I'm a research scientist. My uh, formative years in this field were spent investigating primarily the effects of light on reproductive physiology. More recently, I've become interested in the mechanisms by which light and darkness mediate the effects on reproduction as well as other aspects that it influences. What about you? And I'm a biochemist and I'm really interested in um, the chemicals that carry messages in the brain. And I'm interested in the particular gland, the pineal gland, which is the one that is involved in light-dark regulation, because it can be used as a model for how the brain works in many ways. And as a consequence, I'm interested in light and dark, because indeed that modifies the function of the brain and the pineal and activity in general. Dr. I've had a long personal interest in the pineal gland and melatonin, its hormone, the darkness hormone. And <clears throat> fairly recently I've become particularly interested in how you can use light and this darkness hormone to improve well-being in people. Put it as simply as that. Mm -hmm. Occupational health, reasons for jet lag, for insomnia. Uh, I haven't managed to actually do any research work in all of those areas, but the potential is terrific. We'll be back on that. Leonard Wetterberg. Well, I'm a psychiatrist working here in Stockholm, and uh, I'm interested in uh, how we can use uh, light uh, to study depression, both to understand why some persons get depressed in the spring or fall, some in winter, even some patients in summer. Also in the field of schizophrenia, which I'm very much interested in, and the genetic aspect, why is it that in the first three months of the year there are more persons born or later develop schizophrenia? And the third area is sleep disturbance, which is a very common symptom with all kinds of uh, psychiatric diseases. And uh, Dr. Brainard? 
Yes, I'm a neuroscientist, and I have spent all of my career looking at how light drives biological effects in animals and in humans. And most specifically, we've been concerned with how different wavelengths or colors of light can change hormones in animals and in man, as well as produce therapeutic responses such as the antidepressant effects of light. More recently, we are beginning to look at how these lighting effects can actually be incorporated into architecture in everyday environments. Let me take you and you, the viewers, to a very everyday situation. You are aware, you viewing this program, that tomorrow morning will be an early one. You have to be up at 05.30. You uh, set your alarm clock at 05.30, you go to bed. You wake up often at 5.25, five minutes ahead of the alarm clock. How does this function? How come the biological clock is that hormones, psychology, lack of light? What is it? Russ. Well, this is a phenomenon that's been described. It's referred to as apprehension stress. The biological clock is a very basic internal mechanism that determines these 24-hour rhythms, but it can actually be overridden by certain events, such as the need to get up to catch a plane very early in the morning. Or if put it in the context of a student who has to take an exam the next morning very early, and this individual knows that he or she cannot miss that exam, what typically happens is the individual does not sleep very well and additionally wakes up in advance of the signal from the clock because the clock being overridden. There are confounders in this system. There's no, there are things that make it difficult to understand, and this is an example of one of those. Okay, would any one of you would like to comment on this? I dispute the premise, I think, because yeah. um, I don't think you do sleep right through the night and wake up five minutes before. I think you half sleep. I think you're so concerned about you've got to get up at five o'clock in the morning that you've got half an eye open most of the night, and when it's obvious from the clock, you may not be totally conscious that you're aware of time, mm -hmm. but when it's obvious mm -hmm. that it's time to get up, then you fully wake up. I see. George. Yes, I think human beings have a lot of flexibility in this regard, and we can override some of our internal drives by needs that are driven socially or by sound cues. Left to our own devices, light and darkness will drive the inner clock, but in the context of society, it behaves differently. I think that is also obvious in Joanne's studies in, uh, in Antarctica. In that particular study, the light intensity during the long winter night was very low, and yet the melatonin rhythm in those individuals was synchronized by the social environment, which if these individuals would not have been on a regular work schedule, the melatonin rhythm would actually drift it around. But because of the social circumstances that dictated what these individuals should do, the system was overridden and they remained perfectly synchronized. But coming back to your original question again, um, if, if it's correct <coughs> that you can self-adjust your clock in, in the sense that you wake up very early in the morning, it's probably worth pointing out that you have a perception of time and that, you that your perception of time is controlled by light-dark cycles. And you can stretch the day so that a day is twice as long as it was previously, and your perception of what is an hour then stretches to two hours. And all of this can be done with light and darkness. Another experience uh, <clears throat> which most people have nowadays is um, flying across distances, long distances, covering many time zones. Ja, jag är geolog och arbetar bland annat åt Naturforum i Garpenberg där vi håller på och ordnar olika sorters kurser. Bland annat handlar det om lärarkurser som går till Hawaii och västra delarna av USA. Och det är i samband med de där resorna då när jag kommer hem igen som jag har känt av det här med jetlag. Och det yttrar sig då på olika sätt och det som stör mig mest är det att hela dygnsrytmen rubbas. Så att jag är 
pigg och vaken på natten och, och vill helst av allt sova på dagen. Fast det är det egentligen inte går att göra då eftersom jag då ska sköta ett jobb när jag kommer hem. Så att eh, det brukar vara så att jag när jag lägger mig då på kvällen så vaknar jag vid ett tiden på natten. Och sen är jag vaken då till framåt fem, halv sex. Och då brukar jag kunna somna om igen. Sen är det då ganska snart dags att gå upp igen. Och det blir ju då att det blir inte många timmar sömn per dygn. Och då under nästföljande dag då ser jag ju då naturligtvis trött och sen upprepas det där. Så att jag, vare sig jag lägger mig tidigt eller sent då på kvällen så vaknar jag igen. Och det där har då hållit på så där en tre, fyra veckor varje gång. Nu senaste resan som jag gjorde här i höstas, då eh, hade jag hört talas redan innan då om det här med möjligheten att ta ljusbehandling. Så att eh, så fort jag kom hem då redan första morgonen, ja jag kom hem då på en onsdag och direkt sen då på torsdag morgon så fick jag första omgången. Då satt jag två timmar i ett sånt här ljusrum. Och sen så fick jag en sån här omgång per dag fem gånger. Och sen var jag rätt igen. Så, så att det, det sen funkade. Sen sov jag näst kommande natt. Sjätte morgon då när jag hade tänkt att gå och ta den här ljusbehandlingen då, då såg jag faktiskt över. Då hade jag sovit hela natten och då betraktade jag mig som återställd. Jag har ju haft med mig olika medlemmar i familjen på de här resorna och både min man och några av vuxna och vuxna barnen och där har väl alla reagerat lite olika så att min dotter har väl känt av det här fast den inte är lika stor utsträckning som jag. Däremot så har väl både min man och den son som har varit med återhämtat sig i stort sett omgående när de har kommit hem. Så att det är väl tydligt att det där är individuellt hur känslig man är för det här. How do we react correctly to the protest signals from the biological clock? Can we do anything about it? Or this is just a natural bio biological phenomenon? Russ? We've all made recommendations at various times how to at least partially combat jet lag, the phenomenon of ill feeling when you fly east and west. The interesting issue I always raise is that Animals in that regard are considerably smarter than humans. Animals that migrate, birds that migrate, they migrate north and south where they don't get into these problems. But humans break the rule and start migrating east and west, and that affects the biological clock that we're discussing. How do you combat that? How do you get around it? There are recommendations in terms of foods to eat, There's certainly recommendations in reference to light. That would be an interest of ours. There's recommendations in terms of taking melatonin, that darkness hormone, which I think everyone in the panel here has probably done at one time or another <laughs> to combat jet lag. And I might add that But my you're... experience is, is very good. But uh, Dr. Arndt, you don't buy uh, as, as a layman, you don't, or as, a, as an air passenger, you, you don't buy this uh, melatonin. Not yet. Not Hopefully yet. one day. but. Uh... It's been a very long time in development. There are a lot of problems with this. Uh, at the moment, imitation melatonin is being developed. In other words, a chemical molecule, which is similar and hopefully has similar effects, which can be patented and protected by a patent. But well, I, I want to say, though, uh, there's nothing wrong with melatonin. Oh, no. You didn't mean to imply that. She Not meant, at all. No, it's melatonin great. is the ideal drug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I think that um, it's a problem because it's a right. generic. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I want to ask you, yeah. racehorses get jet lag, don't they? I presume they fly. That's a very good question. It's not only humans that fly around the world, but they frequently take animals, circus animals or horses or whatever mm. the case may be. They suffer from these same types of problems. They're just more difficult. You can't ask a horse. You can ask them, they don't reply. So, you know, you don't know if they're in jet lag as readily, although their performance is certainly down when they're in may, jet lag. May I they're just not? fill in that uh, horses in Vienna, uh, at the circus Please horses, are, have been treated with bright light for 100 years. And with the notion that they are Arabic uh, horses and they are used to bright light. But, but those who are training them say that um, they can see both on the fur and their behavior <coughs> that, that they really function much better. So this is a, a knowledge. Um, is, so there is no sort of 
a universal trick or recommendation oh. for there's for there is definitely one good trick and that is is to take a cruise across the ocean if you're going because then you're not accelerating the internal clock over the time zones really this is a disorder of modern travel and we've only had it for a number of years and the brain has not evolved a new mechanism hence these tricks are needed yeah. you have you have made studies on shift works I mean I've heard during the lectures here and I would like to know do we take care of the knowledge you now have been presented in planning the behavior the surroundings and shift works day night people coming back from day from night work to sh to shift today it, can we improve that how well, should first, it be done first uh, of all, you there, was, there was simply inadequate information i mean certainly attempts have been done uh, and, 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 and there are lots of studies that are ongoing, but to find a perfect, a perfect adaptation, I mean, how long should you be on, on, on a shift? What, what environmental cues should there be to, to, to help you be on shift? You know, the, 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 the problems exist. There's a lot of data. It's hardly a solved problem. Scheduling recommendations exist from experts in the field such as, I believe, Dr. Arkerstedt here in, in Sweden, Dr. Folkard in England, and a great deal of time has been devoted to setting up specific schedules which are less distressing or, if you like, more efficient from a performance po point of view. Well, less dangerous. Less, less dangerous, dangerous, perhaps. Well, the, uh, the, uh, yeah. the, both Chernobyl and the Three Mile Island accidents happen between so two or three in the morning when people are uh, more fatigue and uh, not, not uh, so uh, alert. And there are traffic accidents. Um, pilots may be tired. So, so it may be very important. And I think this with space travel, where it's really needed that people should be uh, alert on all shifts, then uh, we really have the information and know what to do. And uh, we heard that the astronauts at NASA are, are primed with light, so you shift some in one direction, and they work on an earlier shift, and with light later to shift the other in a, a direction in Houston. And they are then uh, transported in this light to Cape Canaveral. So if we really need to uh, have people alert on shift work, uh, the knowledge is there. But then is it practical? George and then Russ. I think the basic problem is this. We are daytime creatures. That's our evolution. And with shift work, we are asked to be awake and performing during the night when biologically we are adapted to be asleep. And I think there are three potential solutions that are developing now, and we don't have all the answers. One is, as Dr. Arendt stated, biocompatible scheduling. Schedules, work schedules which work with the clock instead of against the clock. Secondly, improving the education of the workforce for better sleep hygiene and better dietary hygiene. And thirdly, potentially the use of lights to help the, the workers' clock adapt to the environment. I'd like to echo the inadequacy of information, and you can realize this immediately when you talk to people who are concerned with shift workers. They typically <coughs> cannot agree on what is the best means to combat it. The one thing that seems to be in agreement is something that's already been said. Namely, it would be better to move the schedule forward than to move backward. For the same reason, it's more difficult to fly from the United States to Sweden than from Sweden to the United States. It's more easy to phase advance our rhythms than to phase delay. So shift well, work prolong, is... Prolong the day, yeah. Right, yeah. prolong the day. Yeah in essence. So in terms of shift work, it would be better if you work during the day than to take an early night shift rather than work during the day and then try to go backwards. I think there's general agreement in that area, but how many days they should stay on it, whether they should in fact acclimate, whether they should have naps during their work period when they're working night is all uh, in a state of confusion at the current time. We've been talking uh, about the, uh, the biological clock concerning 24 hours. If, and you mentioned uh, us in Scandinavia. Right. I, I'd like to know, how do people cope living on the uh, Arctic and Antarctic circle? 
to uh, live in constant light and constant darkness. And apparently there are hundreds of thousands of people having their bi biological clock functioning how? Well, they cope with greater difficulty, I think, than those persons living near the equator. We can take some examples. Uh, Thrumso, Norway. They have empirically determined, there's 46,000 people in Thrumso. They know that when the sun sets below the horizon on November 25th, that they have to make certain adaptations. And one of the things they have determined without scientific input is they feel better when they use higher and brighter lights, higher intensity and brighter intensity lights. And this is why electricity consumption in Thrumso is 20% higher than anywhere else in Scandinavia. And they also know that when the sun comes above the horizon, they're going to feel better. They even have a special day to recognize the arising sun on January 21st. But do you Joseph. think that's light, or do you think that it's, there's something about the sun just appearing above the horizon? I suppose that? that's there's part There's a of lot it, of but symbolism involved in yeah. this. Yeah. But does, does this go for general um, environment and when we work? I mean, you mentioned that. We work in two little intensive light. I mean, that's not intensive enough. If do we have to increase the level of lux when it comes to a normal life, so to speak? I believe we are looking at a potential revolution in architectural lighting, but it will not be a simple revolution because we don't need bright light all the time. If we were to provide this at all the times, first of all, it would waste energy. And secondly, there are wrong times of day to have bright light stimuli. So it must be worked out, and the designs yet are not established. B before going into the thera therapy, well, using light as therapy, as a drug, uh, let me just uh, have a small test here. What's the color of this, sir? That's green. That's green. And what's the color of this? Red. That's red. OK. When we talk about light, that's sort of mixture of all these colors, which, which you see, see in, in rainbow. If you would define the effects on the human body on these two colors, are there any differences between red and, and, and green, or I can't make blue here, but uh, blue, of course, stands for George. Absolutely. When we compare the effects of different wavelengths for, for example, suppressing melatonin, we find that the wavelengths in the center of the spectrum are the most powerful. The green and the blue wavelengths have the strongest ability. Red light at a same intensity will not have the same power, but if you raise red light to be bright enough, it too can have this effect, as can, for some human beings, the non-visible ultraviolet light can have these effects. But again, the center of the spectrum seems to be the most powerful in the green range. And you're talking about human beings. I mean, obviously, it is not the same for all creatures. I mean, beasts live in, in different, different kinds of situations. If you're living underwater, the spectrum you see is different than the spectrum you see on land. And so wavelength can be very important and can be different between species. But when it comes to humans, uh, Leonard, you, uh, you treat patients uh, with, with light. Jag heter Ann Kristin. Jag har känt mig så här nedstämd, deprimerad i många år. Det börjar ganska så snart efter semestern. När vi kommer in i september så, så känns det att man går ner i varv. Man har ingen energi, man har ingen åk. Hur man än tar sig i kragen så hjälper det inte. Jag stiger upp kvart i fem, fem med hjälp av att min man väcker mig. Annars kanske jag inte hade kommit upp. Och så tar jag med mig lite frukt och en smörgås och åker iväg in till Sankt Göran. Och så kommer jag hit här och här finns det kaffe och te. Så att jag kan ta min smörgås och äta den här. Vill jag läsa så kan jag göra det. Och finns det några som vill diskutera så gör vi det också. Och vi kan skatta och ha riktigt roligt här. Och vill man bara sitta ner och... 
fundera för sig själv så går det bra. Men man måste titta så man får inte lov att, att somna. Och sen när de här två timmarna har gått, jag sitter på morgonen då mellan sex och åtta. Och sen eh, så ger jag mig iväg. Strax efter åtta, jag åker tunnelbana och tar pendeln till Huddinge. Och är tillbaka på arbetet. Och det känns som en liten vitamininjektion. Nej, det känns bra. Det är det bästa för min del. Liten tills kanske jag ska säga, men det är en stor skillnad. The viewers probably think that light is a sort of universal men mental medicine, which it is not. Well, uh, we talk about bright light. Uh, then it's as uh, George said, we shouldn't sit in it all day. That's very irritating. So the question is, how long time, the duration, uh, when should the light be given uh, in the, the, uh, during the 24 hours? And which wavelength? And how often? And what are the individual differences, as you said, with aging, when the lens is uh, getting uh, shading out some colors. So what we uh, have come up with uh, in a white room where we can have about 10 patients sitting and getting the same amount of light, we give two hours in the morning. Because if you give more, uh, then you don't get more beneficial effect. We don't know how short we can cut this, if one hour or half hour or 50 minutes is enough. So that, that's uh, ongoing. We also don't know if green or red is better than the whole spectrum. The idea right now is that it should be as uh, close to sunlight as possible. Okay. Do patients who are depressed and you treat with light, do they prefer light as opposed to a drug therapy? And how effective are drugs relative to light therapy? Is there an advantage to light therapy? Uh, as they say, very good question, because um, uh, in the first place, we have tried to do a crossover. So we should give uh, uh, next year, say, we'll offer you light treatment or drug. And we have not got any patient who previously have used light treatment to volunteer to take a drug instead. Mm. But also another uh, of the patients we are recruiting, they may previous years have been uh, trying drugs, and many of those with winter depression really have had severe side effects to or drug. to the drug, yeah. or they may have had uh, professional work needed to be able to read and this double vision on, on uh, drugs, and so they have not been able to, to work. So that's, of course, a, a selection. And those who have used uh, light, it's very difficult to get them to use uh, uh, so they're very happy with the therapy. They're, 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 they're very happy, and uh, they have founded a patient association called Ljuspunkten, the light point. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they are very, they are gathering information. And I mean, they are absolutely convinced uh, because they are the real experts on uh, how beneficial light may be to carry them over the, the dark. But I think we can look at uh, light as vitamins uh, or food. You, you need vitamin A, B, C, D if you are lacking one. Uh, vitamin uh, B, it's not uh, good to supplement with the other or if it's B12. So um, in 10 years time, I think that maybe you'll, uh, you should have green light and maybe of a certain intensity a specific time of day. So and this, uh, is, this is vitamin A, is it? Right, right. Vitamin A. Maybe this for B. for 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 some. And uh, sure. uh, we know that there are colorblind people. And what has come up, which uh, I think two very interesting uh, prospects, that's that there are in besides rod and cones in uh, the wow. retina that's uh, seeing the red and green may be an other type of receptor that may be very important. Dr. Juweiler? Well, but, you know, but, and also, obviously, color is important. I mean, there are industries built upon, uh, upon color preferences, uh, and the color preferences aren't there for nothing. 
I mean, uh, 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 insects see not the color as we see it, but plants are colored the way they are to attract insects to pollinate them. Uh, color, color wavelength is clearly important. I mean, you know, the, a blue mood is a blue mood. Why is it a blue mood? Because that has a certain emotional component to it. And, uh, and of course, that's related to the fact that the sky is blue and that water is blue. Yellow is hot because the sun is hot. You know, so, I mean, I mean, uh, people, have, there, are e there are even some studies that have been done looking at the effect of color on psychiatric patients and whether or not they are helped by having a mood, I mean, ha having, having a, a different color room. If you watch the frequency of, of what room they will go into depending upon what color it is. There have uh, been a couple of studies that have looked at that. Could you elaborate on artists? Um, uh, famous artists Certainly. having different um, pictures of, of, of sure. the environment. Well, what about Van Gogh? Oh, certainly. Uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the incoming, incoming color in the area, the, 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 f the mood you want to generate, but that changes. As Dr. Baynard has shown, the, the eye yellows. And, the, and as the eye yellows, the artist changes his colors as he gets older in order to get the effect that he wants to get. I mean, somebody commented that the constable and uh, it was Turner, I guess. Was it Turner? Turner began to, to, to change his, 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 his colors as his eye began to get yellow. And he was trying to match what was in his head with what he kept seeing. This is a very interesting aspect of this story, and that is, is that as young human beings, children, actually see a different range of colors than we who have aged a bit. And it is due to changes inside of the, the eye in the lens. Children see blues much brighter and violets much brighter, and are actually are able to see a little bit down into the ultraviolet spectrum. But by the time we reach later in adulthood, we've lost this ability. Uh, I, I think it's, it's quite obvious that we've now been talking the, of the importance of the visual system, giving signals into the hormone machinery. Uh, but what about blind people? How do they get signals to this wonderful biological clock governing so much? It seems that very large numbers of blind people are not, in fact, properly organized from a clock point of view. Um, if they have no perception of light, their internal rhythms, the overt ones of sleep-wake and the internal ones of hormones, seem to run at a different periodicity than 24 hours. It's not true of all blind people by any means, but it is true of some. And this periodicity can be up to 25 hours, and in very rare, rare cases, less than 24 hours. So that the lack of the light-dark time cue is very important. What's more, um, when their sleep is running free, as this is called, they can be very sleepy in the middle of the day and wide awake in the middle of the night. And this can cause a lot of problems. Light is very painful. When, we got, when you've got headache. Here we've been talking about light as a therapy, as a drug being help, helpful. You uh, help patients. Can light be not just painful, but hazardous? Sure. Absolutely. Uh, overexposure to light can do several things that are toxic. It can burn the skin. It can burn portions of the eye. Uh, certainly, everyone knows that uh, one doesn't stare directly at the sun for any length of time because that will cause blindness. We're not talking in light therapy about levels of light that are hazardous, however. We're talking about things that are much lower than actual hazardous levels. Look at the situation. Light is just, it, it, it is there. Does not this mean that moonshiners or amateurs or charlatans would, would use light therapy, say, come to us, we have got light sure. therapy for you. Sure. Isn't that a, a big danger? Unfortunately, there are any number of charlatans who are doing exactly that without being very familiar with what they are doing. There are instruments sold by these individuals where you can expose yourself to different colors of light, and they make all kinds of claims, almost like witchcraft 
aircraft for the treatment of any number of disease states. That's a very, very unfortunate situation. And it's not unique to phototherapy, to light therapy. It's common in all areas of medicine and many other professional areas. Yes, I'd like to be very strong on this point because I think there's been tremendous publicity and public interest in the use of lights for therapeutic purposes. And I think the best advice is if one feels they have a psychiatric disorder that light might be useful for, first they should seek a professional diagnosis from a recognized professional. And secondly, they should employ lights only as directed, because it is a medicine, it is a therapy, it's not something trivial. Um, if, um, if I would ask you, each of you, to give the viewers a, a personal good piece of advice, how to improve their relations to light, everyday life, we've been touching on these things, what do we most neglect, for example? Russ. Right. I think we should look at light as a drug. We've all been saying that. It is a drug because it very strongly influences a part of brain melatonin production in the pineal gland. And as a consequence, we shouldn't abuse light. In other words, we evolved. Man evolved like other animals in a regular light-dark environment. We have learned to live with that type of environment and adjust our physiology accordingly. I guess the bottom line is that light can be abused. Light, bright light, particularly at unusual times in the middle of the night, is less than ideal because our brain gets the wrong information and sends the wrong information to the remainder of the body. So I guess as closely as possible, we should stay with the regular alternating light-dark environments. That doesn't mean we're going to as a species because we've already established the fact we're going to continue to abuse ourselves with jet lag and so forth. But as much as possible, have a dark alternating with a light environment for every 24-hour period. And, uh, uh, Dr. Wirtz Justice at the meeting commented that, and she's from Switzerland, said that, that, the, uh, that one should go on out for a good walk in the sun, about an hour's walk, and that does a great deal for your psyche. And she had data to back it up. And I think it's a great idea. <laughs> and not too sophisticated. Not too And very cheap. Very cheap. OK. Josephine. I think you should have a skiing holiday in the winter. Lots of bright light off the snow. <clears throat> a month somewhere by the sea in the summer. <laughs> Lots of gardening in the summer evenings. Mm -hmm. And a good book in the winter. A walk after lunch. And perhaps a bottle of melatonin pills one day in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Leonard. <laughs> well, uh, at the meeting, Daniel Kripke from San Diego had um, uh, studied uh, re persons in San Diego, how much they sp time they spent in sunlight by having a watch w with a photometer. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, surprisingly, many persons were not out in sunlight for one hour, even in uh, sunny California or some as little as 50 minutes when they walked from the car to, to the office and, and, and back. And you said it's, it's very cheap. Obviously, if time is money and uh, people don't spend an hour a day outside, my recommendation is uh, the same, particularly at our uh, latitude in Sweden, to take a brisk walk. OK, George, your piece and good advice. Right. I think that we've all been working on a very complex biological system, the biological clock and the hormones that uh, work from it. And that's been great scientific fun. But when it comes down to it, we come back to the very simple conventional wisdom that for optimum health of the human being, we need good food, good sleep, fresh air, and sunshine. Could we ask the electrician to just say thank you to you and Dim down the light. These people are going to produce melatonin. So could we have the lights down, please?